The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Linux Fest. Um, I am very pleased to announce that for every single year uh, that SELF has existed, the community, the people who pay $65 for a supporting registration, have outgiven our largest corporate sponsors. And this year you have done it again, so give yourselves a round of applause. Uh, so your, uh, your morning keynote is Taras Balog. He is the CEO of OpenNMS. And because if you've been to enough tech conferences and seen the glowing pieces of fruit in the audience, uh, this is a very interesting and relevant talk. So um, I will get out of the way as quickly as possible so that Taurus has all the time in the world. We'll have a raffle after the closing keynote. We have some swag from No Starch, uh, some books from No Starch, and some other stuff to raffle off. Uh, if you've got a badge, you're entered into the raffle. So uh, without further ado, Taurus. Okay, let's see if this is gonna work. Is that good? Are we good in the back? I have a big booming voice and I'm also Hungarian so I speak with my hands a lot. Um, I wanna thank you folks for coming out. Uh, I know there was some partying last night and it's early in the morning. I, I spoke itself, I guess uh, two years ago and I had the 9 a.m. Sunday slot. We started at 9.30 because there was no, I was the only person up at 9 a.m. So. Anyway, I've got this, this talk today, I call it No Apple, or how I uh, learned to start worrying and love the Linux desktop. Um, I am very uh, happy to see that there's very few glowing fruit in the front row here. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm basically gonna talk about um, my experiences in going from uh, being an Apple fanboy to actually using Linux and FOSS every single day um, for everything I used to use Apple for. Now. So here's some speaker tips. First of all, let's thank the Southeast Linux Fest people. We gave ourselves a hand, let's give them a hand. Um, I put on a very small conference uh, every year for OpenNMS, which is, we have 30 people. It's actually a record. We have 30 people showing up for our developers conference. And it's a pain for 30 people. They have considerably more people showing up for this thing. And, um, it really warms my heart. When I started uh, doing open source full time in 2001, the only conferences you saw were like Linux World. And you'd go and they're big corporate conferences. I went to the last Linux World and there were probably 300 people there. It was a ghost town, it was depressing. Because these conferences, these user conferences, grassroots conferences are so much better and so much more successful um, that it takes a lot of work. Now I wanna start off with a story. Okay, a little, little story. Two fish swimming along, and they see an older fish coming the other way. And the older fish kind of nods at him, says, good morning, boys, how's the water? And the little fish, little small fry, they kind of nod at him, and they keep swimming. And as soon as the big fish is out of earshot, one fish turns to the other fish and goes, what the heck's water? <laughs> now, I stole that story. I stole that story from um, a commencement speech by the author David Foster Wallace. Um, and the, his point was, Sometimes we are so surrounded by things, we forget they're there. And what I want you to take away from this presentation is that every day you make choices on what technology you use and how you create your information and how you share your information. And quite frequently you get into these patterns where you don't even realize you're making these decisions. And uh, that was the way it was when I was uh, using Apple products. I just used Apple products. If I needed something, I went and got the Apple version. Um, and I got in this rut. And I think it's a bit of a dangerous rut. I mean, you guys have taken the first step. You made the choice to be here. Now, granted, Charlotte weather isn't exactly beautiful this time, uh, but it's great. You made a choice to be here, get up this morning, and come uh, learn about Linux and open source software. So that's great. Uh, I think there's a few other things. Okay. 
I'm an Apple fanboy, or was. Um, this is a picture from the Cult of Mac website. Um, a few years ago, I, I actually rescued uh, an original Mac that was going to the dumpster. Got it on the internet and stuff like that because my first computer was a TRS-80 Model 1. <laughs> so we probably have, uh, it's 1978, I got it for Christmas. I was like, yeah, Model 1. Um, and then my dad, he got the, uh, the IBM 5150 with the 256K in discrete chips soldered to the motherboard. You know, he only needed 640K, I mean, 256, wow, that's halfway there. Um, and I got 64 gig in my phone, you know. The, um, so uh, when uh, I got first exposed to Apple, I guess around 86, a friend of mine bought, he was in college, he bought a Mac Plus, and I loved it. And um, so I started open, when I started working in open source in 2001, I didn't really start making money until about 2003. And I said, I've been working for two years really hard, I deserve a cool laptop. So I went to the lug, the Tri-Lug is, is my home lug, and everyone was buying these things called PowerBooks. And so I started looking into them, I said, I'm gonna get me a PowerBook. And so my first modern Mac was when uh, the 12-inch PowerBook came out. So how many people here, show of hands, own an Apple product? So MacBook, iPod, iPod phone, whatever they are. Okay, so keep your hands up if you use a MacBook as your primary laptop. Now keep your hands up if you use OS X on that MacBook. Okay, so we have a fairly large number of hands here. You know, we're at an open source conference. You obviously have some interest in free and open source software, and yet we have a large number of people using this very proprietary hardware and software. And I did it too, you know, I'm like, oh wow. And so I pulled out what I called my credit cards. I had my credit cards. You know, well, of course I can use OS X. It's based on Darwin. And Darwin's free BSD, so it's open, right? Right, it's open, and I like that, you know? And I can use open source on it. One of my guys uh, is a, a maintainer of the Fink project, so I can install all this GNU Linux goodness on my Mac, so that's kind of cool too, right? I've got my, my credit cards. And finally, well, I can always switch later, right? So I can always switch later, that's not a problem. So, what happened to make me change? This happened. This is a building in Budapest, Hungary. Um, one of the perks, well, one of the downsides is my, of my job is I travel a lot. But the perks is I get lots of frequent flyer miles and lots of hotel points, so um, every year my wife and I take a fairly elaborate vacation. And two years ago, we decided we were going to take our Eastern European tour. So we went to Dresden, and I had to really, as an American, if you're ever in Dresden, you really apologize for February 13th through 15th, 1945. It's like, oh, here's our church, and it, but it's a little burnt from the fire. And, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't do anything. And I ended up in Budapest, and on the main street in Budapest, you see this building, and it has the word terror. It's called the House of Terror. Now, one of the big perks of my job is that anywhere I go, I tend to run into at least one person who uses OpenNMS. And so I had dinner with this guy named Paul Kish, and I was telling him, I said, yeah, I saw that building downtown, that house of terror. I recognize a tourist trap when I see one. I said, I'm not going there. And he looked at me very seriously. And he said, you really need to go there. This building housed the secret police uh, under the Order of the White Cross, which is basically the Nazi occupation of Hungary. And then after World War II, the Soviets found the building so useful, they continued the process of uh, detaining people in this building. So when you walk in, you're greeted by this huge tank. It's very intimidating. Uh, you're in a kind of a confined space, and you see, kind of get a feeling of what someone might have felt had a tank come walking down, you know, come driving down their street. Um, and you work your way through the building. It's one part museum, one part art exhibition, and one part memorial. Um, there's little niches in the walls, and there's phones. And you pick up a phone, and you hear these voices talking. It's in Hungarian, and I don't speak Hungarian. Um, so I've been told, though, that these are uh, conversations that were recorded, and the people who were recorded were detained. And uh, so you go and you see how the, the government controlled mail and uh, phone communications, which were the two major communications of the time. And you see the, the show, uh, show trials. I was desperately looking through the roles of all the bad people to make sure there was no bailouts, you know. Uh, so I was like, oh, great, no, no evil Baylog judges or evil Baylog policemen. Um, and then finally, you take this elevator, this slow elevator ride into the basement. In this basement, they have the cells they used. Um, sorry, I get a little choked up. 
Um, I mean, one cell was really narrow, and you had to stand like this. In another cell, um, it was maybe three feet tall, and they filled it with water. So they had to crouch in water. And you get to this one room, and uh, Hungary is struggling because some of the people who were on the wrong side of this um, are still around. I mean, they, they never had a Nuremberg trial. They never brought these people to justice. So there's this film, and it's these women, and they were all detained, and they're telling about this degradation. Um, that they had at the hands of this one commandant. And, um, you know, it was, it was, there was some physical abuse, but mainly it was a psychological abuse that they heaped on these women. Then they bring the commandant in. And she's this uh, elderly woman, but immaculately dressed and coiffed. And, and she's like, oh, you should be thanking me because I was just so nice to you. And it really affected me. And um, I did find a Balog. There's a Laszlo Balog who was killed in this building. They killed 600 people in this building. So not to bum you out first thing Saturday morning, but I was like, wow, look at what a government was able to do with just phone calls and emails. Now, I'm a news junkie, but when I'm on vacation, I kind of have a rule. I don't read my RSS feeds. I don't do anything. So I come back to the United States, and the first thing that pops up is iCloud. So Apple is introducing iCloud. So not only do they want you to put your mail and your calendar on the cloud, they want you to put your documents and your contacts and your, when, when you meet with them and everything, like, just put it on the cloud. It's so convenient. Trust me, we, we won't do anything bad with it. It's convenient. You should use it. And I'm picking Apple out here, but it could have been, um, it could have been uh, Google. It could be Facebook. Uh, anyone who wants your information and offers you something for free, there's usually something on the back end they're going to use that for. Um, the reason I put up Apple here is that when you installed Lion, this is what you see. It's really hard to kind of opt out. And it's kind of the default is, hey. But, but we really don't have anything to worry about, right? Because we have Congress. <laughs> now, this is, is some of you, uh, this is a family show, so I put the penguins up here. But this is a self-portrait. <laughs> this is a self-portrait of uh, Congressman Anthony Weiner. <laughs> you, you can't make stuff like that up. You can't write that. You know. So Anthony Weiner is busy twit-picking, uh, compromising pictures of himself around the internet. You know? So this is the guy who's going to stop Apple and Google from doing bad things, right? No, he doesn't get it, okay? And at this point in time, I said, look, if I'm ever going to switch, I have to switch now. Because I was so entrenched in the Apple ecosystem with iPhoto and all this other stuff that I was going to, it, it, unless I did something, I would, I would never switch. So let's get rid of that. So, mission impossible. I set out, I, I, I posited, okay, I love open source, so I'm going to switch. My goal is to switch from Apple to free and open software and as much as I can hardware, and I don't want to give up anything. I'm greedy. I liked OS X. I liked the apps I got, so I'm going to see, can I do this? And at the end of the presentation, I'll let you be the judge of whether or not I was successful. So, first thing. What was I using? I had a couple of 24-inch iMacs. I used to carry around a laptop, and then I got kind of bored with that because I was always I had to do the laptop drive of shame and go back home and get it when I forgot it. So I bought a couple of uh, iMacs, stuck one in the office, one at home, and I, I used cloudy stuff to, to keep all my stuff synced. Um, so I had a couple of iMacs for traveling. I had an 11-inch MacBook Air running Snow Leopard. I had an iPhone 4. Uh, I used an Airport Extreme at home. I had lots of little Airport Expresses so that I could stream music around the house. Um, and I also have a Mac Mini running ITV. It's a DVR software, so my DVR was based on Mac. So I set out saying, this is what I want to replace. Can I do it? Now, the first thing, if you embark in this mission, the first thing you need to do, well, let me skip back. Determine what are your critical apps. What do you use every day? I sat down and I basically took, had a scratch pad, and every time I launched an app, I wrote it down. And I didn't do this, but you could put little check marks every time you launch the app so that you could see what you use. And for me, it's mail. I'm old. 1978, TRS-80, old. I'm an email guy. I'm not a Twitter guy. I'm not an SMS guy. I'm an email guy. I actually want to put on my resume, job description, I answer and write emails, because that's literally what I do for a living. Um, Pardon? I thought I heard a comment. Feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind. Um, calendar's real important to me because I travel a lot and organizing. You know, we're a services organization, so uh, being able to schedule when and where people are is very, very important. 
web browsing, of course, office gear, things like that. I used QuickBooks. That's what I used to run the company. So I needed that. So I wrote down all my lists because the biggest complaint I tend to hear people go is, well, I just have to have this particular piece of software. So I can't switch from either Windows or OS 10. And that may be true, but I might say, well, can you run it in a VM? How often do you use it? Can you run it in a VM? Can you switch everything else? So for me, I had to analyze, and I'm like, okay, I bet there's applications out there that will allow me to do all of these things. So that was my first step. I put this up here. This was not an easy journey. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this now for two years. I guess uh, the last 18 months, I've been pretty solid um, open source software. But at one point in time, I remember I ran screaming to the back room, grabbed my iMac and ran back and reinstalled and said, I've got to use this. Uh, so frustration. It is, I was trying to achieve something, was running into problems. Um, part of this presentation is I hope you will embark on this quest yourself and I'm hoping to give you some tips um, that will help you make it easier and learn from my mistakes. Because isn't that kind of what open source is all about? So, if you want to try this out on Apple hardware, you can dual boot your Mac. You know, so, so it's kind of like dipping your toe in the water. You can, you can see what, what, what's going to happen. Um, there are very uh, many ways to do this. One of the greatest things I think Apple ever did was come up with an application called Time Machine. I think it came out around Tiger. I forget exactly when it was, but when Steve Jobs, you know, the one more thing was Time Machine. I'm like, what? Back up in the store? You know, if you've ever used it, it's amazing because you can back it up, shove an install disk in, and restore everything. You can restore from one, app, one uh, type of hardware to another type of hardware. I have yet to be able to find um, the equivalent in, uh, in the open source world. I do have backup solutions that I use. But, um, so if you're doing this and you're not using Time Machine, try it because it'll save you, again, some frustration. If you run into problems and you end up pooching your hard disk by what I'm about to tell you to do, you can always restore from Time Machine and not worry about it. Now, if you only want to run two operating systems on your, uh, on your Mac, um, use Boot Camp. Boot Camp is an app that's under utilities. It will allow you to um, repartition your hard disks um, without having to reinstall o o OS X. You can just, there's a little slider. You can move it and say, hey, give me another partition. If you use Boot Camp, at the point it asks you to install Windows, just shove in your install disk, reboot, and run it from there because you already have a partition you can use. Um, what I do is I have these training machines that I use um, that we try boot. We actually run Windows, Ubuntu, and uh, OS X on them. And here's some commands. These slides should be available. I sent them to Jeremy, so they should be up somewhere. Um, but here's some commands. You can actually stick the install disk in, choose utilities, launch the terminal application, and run this from the command line, and this will partition your main hard disk into three partitions. Then you can use those to install uh, Linux or anything else you want. Now, this is a, you may not need to do this anymore, but when I started this, a lot of operating systems were still based on master boot record, in, uh, MBR. Uh, everything's migrating now to EFI. And there was this, this app you could download. It's no longer maintained uh, as of uh, March, but it, it still works fine, called Refit. And what it allows you to do is it'll add a menu to OS X, so when you boot, you'll be able to choose which partition to boot. Um, I'm not 100% sure this is required, but since I haven't had to do it, there was a hand? OK. Um, so uh, I'm not sure it was required, because um, a lot of stuff is EFI aware now. Um, but uh, if you do decide to do this, I always install Refit because it gives me this nice little, um, nice little menu here where I can just boot to uh, any of my operating systems. Now, when you install Refit, uh, you usually just hit standard install. When you get to the point where it allows you to customize it, the one option you have is to add the Linux file system drivers. So if you install Refit, be sure to check the box for the file system drivers so it'll understand um, uh, the, the different file systems that we're running, like EXT. It says EXT2, but it'll understand 3 and 4 as well. Once you've got Refit installed, um, you have this option called Start Partitioning Tool. As soon as you've partitioned your disk, every time you touch the partitioning table, run this partitioning tool, because it creates this pseudo uh, MBR record so that the operating systems can do it. And once you do it, reboot. 
Because if you don't reboot, apparently it doesn't take effect. I found this out the hard way. <laughs> so um, once you have this going, all of your, uh, any distribution you choose should recognize the hard drive uh, in such a way that you can boot. Now, master boot record will only allow for four primary partitions. EFI takes one of them. So there'll be an EFI partition that you have to leave alone. So that leaves you with three partitions. So if you're using master boot record, you can only have three operating systems. Now, uh, EFI, I think, will do 256 or maybe theoretically unlimited. So there's really nothing. Now, this is just the boot partition. If you want to set up Linux with boot, var, home, you can. Just make sure that the boot partition is a primary partition. That's all extra credit stuff for most of you, but I wanted to throw that out there. Now, here's a religious question. Which distribution? Um, now, I'm not, and, and I, I don't mean to offend anyone by leaving like Arch or Gen 2 or anything off this list. Um, but it just seemed, these are distributions that um, in some way or another could be uh, used for desktops. Uh, I, the Arch guys are here um, this weekend, so feel free to talk to them. They will admit that they're more of a developer's distribution. It's a great distribution, but again, their focus is a little different than end-user desktops. Um, Debian, I put Debian on here. Uh, it's not really considered a desktop by most people. It's not considered a desktop distro. I put Debian here because it's kind of the grandfather of a couple of these, and um, the Debian folks are really into free, <laughs> annoyingly so as sometimes. <laughs> um, like I use, uh, I do network management, and the, they decided the SNMP MIB definitions weren't free enough, so you actually have to install non-free to get your MIB definitions loaded, and it's a bit of a pain. Um, but uh, I, have, I have run Debian as a desktop. I'll talk about that briefly. Um, Fedora and Ubuntu are probably the two mainstream distributions. If you look at people who, who uh, commercial software vendors that support uh, distributions on Linux, they tend to target those two. Um, I'm in, I live near Raleigh, so I tried Fedora because that's, you know, it's the Red Hat desktop distribution and uh, Red Hat's just down the road. Um, I ended up using Ubuntu and I'll talk about uh, reasons why in a second. Um, uh, Ubuntu is a fork of Debian. Uh, this guy named Mark Shuttleworth founded a company called Thought, made a bunch of money and decided he was going to do a Linux distro. Uh, so he founded a company called Canonical. They released Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu is a fork of Debian. Uh, well, when we start talking about desktops, some people got pissed at Ubuntu, so they forked Ubuntu and formed Linux Mint. Um, and this is the beauty of open source. If you don't like something, you're free to change it. Um, I also put SUSE up here. Um, if there's a distribution I personally don't like, it's SUSE. Uh, mainly because of YAST. I don't like their packaging system. Um, but they were one of the first that really gave it the old college try about having a desktop distribution. So I felt it was only fair to put them up here. Um, again, choice. You're swimming in an ocean of choice. And yeah, it requires a little bit of work. But I wanted everyone to be aware there's a lot of choices out there for your distributions. The choices don't stop there. Well, first of all, okay, when you start installing this stuff, you might see this screen, a nice black screen with a little flashing cursor. <laughs> now, what I love about open source is how detailed and wonderful the error messages are. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, from this, you can see that, um, uh, you know, what the heck is this? It turns out this little thing is usually caused by NVIDIA graphics cards. I, don't, I bet you could get it to happen under an ATI graphics card or an Intel. What I found out is there's this little trigger in the kernel called no mode set. If you're installing a distribution, somewhere will say modify, when you're installing it, it'll say, do you want to modify kernel options? Put in no mode set equal to yes, or just no mode set, and it will get you to the installer. Once the installer runs, they usually install Nouveau or proprietary drivers that will let it work from there on out. But getting you over that installation hump, no mode set is your friend. Again, I hope I just saved a bunch of time for somebody on that. Um, so of course, now that we've chosen a distro, we need to choose a desktop. Of course, the Linux desktop is dead. I read it in the internet, so it has to be true. Um, this bothers me. This really bothers me because my brain shut off when I read this. When I hear Linus Torvalds talk about how GNOME 3 sucks, my brain shuts off. I mean, why should I, go OS why should I leave OS 10? I think they're both wrong. I think what they should say is sucks for me. <laughs> because again, it's choice. Everyone's different. I can remember, um, I worked for this company, 
And the guy left, and he had a better laptop than I had, so I asked for it. I said, can I have Jim's laptop? So I get it and open it up. This is the Windows day, so this is in the 90s. I open it up, and it's just covered with icons. And I haven't, you know, I'm a geek. I think all geeks to some point are a little OCD. <laughs> and I like a clean desktop, you know, that's my to-do list. I put things on my desktop and I remove them. And so seeing this thing, and I was, you know, I wanted to show how smart I was. So I was talking to the IT manager. Oh, look at this guy. Ooh, it's all cluttered. And he kind of just sighed and he said, <laughs> yeah, like that, you know. <laughs> Um, so there, uh, you know, and he basically said, that's why you can customize a desktop. It's choice. You shouldn't force your opinions. There isn't a wrong answer as long as you get your job done. As, I mean, I bet you're incredibly successful at what you do with your desktop with all those stuff on it, you know, and you can find things very quickly if it works for you. That's the key point. Whenever you're making these technology decisions, if it works for you is a huge plus in that column. Now, so I started exploring, so okay, you know, I'm, I'm scared of this house of terror, I'm going to use a desktop. I was trying to figure out what desktop to use. You would be, I have four up here, there's easily double that in, in, in uh, useful, commonly used desktops. Um, I have up here GNOME 3. I used GNOME 3 for a while uh, when I was on Fedora and on Debian. I, used, I installed Debian Wheezy for GNOME 3. They're beautiful. I mean, you think about, and, and I have to admit, again, we get set in these patterns. I was using OS X, so OS X had to be the most beautiful thing on the planet. Oh, it was so beautiful. Then I had to install Windows 7 for my wife's job, and I was like, wow, that's kind of pretty. And I start looking at these guys, and they're gorgeous. I liked GNOME 3. Uh, it was a bit of a paradigm shift. It was a little frustrating at first, but what I liked about GNOME 3 is it let you do what you needed to do, and then it kind of got out of the way. I mean, there weren't any cascading menus, and it, it kind of, you know, stuff just the little launcher bar there could go away, and you're just looking at a blank desktop with your apps on it. I kind of like that. Um, another great desktop is KDE, and KDE gets a lot of flack. I, I love that they just released, what, 4.5, and on Slashdot, it's like, all oh, the three KDE users must be very proud, you know. Um, but I like KDE. KDE is another gorgeous desktop. Um, the big KDE difference is that they're trying for this huge integrated suite of applications. So they have their own mail client, their own office suite, their own browser. And um, the thing that bothered me about KDE the most was it's so configurable, I didn't have a time to, it wasn't easy for me to get it to where I wanted it to be. Um, now, Ubuntu released uh, too much fanfare, this thing called Unity. They got probably as much flack about Unity as GNOME 3 got for their release. Um, I like Unity, especially coming from a Mac, because it's analogous. I mean, let's be honest, Shuttleworth is trying very hard to rip off Apple. <laughs> and Apple ripped off Xerox and everybody else, you know, so, you know, is it really bad? It's sharing, it's all about sharing, right? Um, <laughs> so a bunch of people said, we don't like what Canonical's doing, we don't like the direction they're taking, so we're gonna fork it and we're gonna form Mint. And I believe the, the, I remember reading something just recently that Mint is the number one desktop now based upon some browser history or something they said. It looks like a lot of people who use Linux desktops like Mint. Mint is uh, an Ubuntu fork that brings back a cascading menu kind of operating system. So you have in the bottom here, you have your little menus just like you did with Windows and just like you did with GNOME 2. Um, again, uh, uh, um, play with them. You can run GNOME 3 on Ubuntu. By default, they install Unity, but there's nothing preventing you. In fact, there's a Kubuntu uh, uh, derivative where they just make Ubuntu uh, focused on KDE. There's an Xbuntu, which is um, XFCE, another window manager. Um, you have a lot of options. Um, but what I'm gonna propose is, I chose Ubuntu with Unity, and these are the reasons why. Again, I was coming from a Mac environment. I really liked the fact that I could work on my Mac but I didn't have to work on my Mac, if you get my drift. Um, Ubuntu, it's simple support for proprietary drivers. Uh, Debian, you know, if you want to install anything that's non-free, you gotta jump through a few little hoops. Here it's just like, would you like to install these proprietary drivers? Boom, you get your wireless drivers, you get your, uh, now the thing we all should be doing is buying um, software, uh, hardware that has software support uh, for free and open source software drivers. But at the time, I'd already invested in all the glowing fruit, and I needed to use the glowing fruit, and I needed proprietary drivers. In Unity, they had this thing called the launcher. It's very analogous to the dock. Um, everyone complains because Ubuntu forces it to be on the left, whereas you can move it around on uh, OS X. You can't put it at the top, but you can move it right, right on the left. 
Um, I actually like that because as screens become wider, uh, vertical uh, real estate's more important to me, especially if you're writing code, um, than, than horizontal. So I was already moving my dock to the left, so it was an, for me, it was an easy choice. Shuttleworth does remind me of jobs. Um, one of the failings I think about KDE is they are so accommodating for all possible combinations that it makes it hard for any one person to get it to where they needed to be. Uh, jobs basically said, I'm going to tell you what you want. And to some degree, Shuttleworth's the same way, but the major difference is there's nothing Shuttleworth can do that I can't undo. There was a big kerfuffle because um, when, uh, it, what it was, was it, uh, um, it, was, it wasn't pompous pederast, it was the one that came after that, the Q one. Um, they, uh, he announced when you do a, a search for files, it would actually go to Amazon and do a search and look stuff up. And everyone's like, oh, that's horrible. And RMS got something, he goes, that's horrible. You're, 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 you've got a root kit. You're, you're. And then, of course, Shuttleworth is very, if you've ever looked at Mark Shuttleworth, he's very politic and very diplomatic. <laughs> so, of course, he said, well, I already have root. I can do anything I want, <laughs> which isn't an unfalse statement. He could have phrased it a little differently. But, um, you know, within, you know, if, if, if Canonical does anything to Ubuntu, within six hours, someone has written a package that allows me to turn it off. So when I install Ubuntu, I just hit no, you know, and if I don't like it, I can go to Mint. I have choice. Um, it is one of the most popular desktop distros, and what Shuttleworth has done in creating a popular desktop distro is he's given proprietary software vendors something to write to. I can play Steam games now natively on my Linux desktop, um, and that's something I couldn't do before. Now, the beauty of it is, if it runs on Ubuntu, someone will find out how to run it on Mint, and someone will find out how to run it on Fedora, and someone will find out, but you need that toe in the door, and that's what Ubuntu gives us. Um, so I started with Naughty Night Nurse, and then when uh, Onanistic Oliphant came out, I was like, I hate this. Something about it, I can't even remember what pissed me off. But I ran and I, I booted to Debian. I ran Debian Wheezy for about six or seven weeks, and then that pissed me off. So I went to Fedora, and then that pissed me off. And so I went back to Ubuntu, and I kind of liked it again. And I don't know what, I don't, again, it was just me. Um, but part of this was pompous pederast, the LTS version came out. Now, if you, the way Ubuntu does releases, this may change, but they have been doing every six months. So you'll end up with 10.04 is April of 2010. And then t six months later, you get 10.10, .10, which is October of 2010, et cetera. But every so often, they come out with a long-term support. And this is 12.10. Uh, 12 is that right? No, 12.04, 12.04. So April of 2012, for five, three years, they promised to support this release. LTS, Ubuntu LTS is probably one of the most stable operating systems I've ever used. Now, on my desktop at, at work, I upgrade to the latest. At the desktop at home and on my laptop, I stick with LTS. And I don't like the, there's issues. They're not nearly as stable. But man, LTS is rock solid. I really, really like it. There's a software center, so it's like the App Store. You can go and you can buy proprietary and um, free software, or download free software through the software center. I use Apt. I tend not to use it, but it's there. And my favorite part is they have these things called PPAs. These are repositories that are very easy to install that lets me track a particular application or group of applications outside of Ubuntu. Like when I talk about audio players, I use Banshee, so I can actually track Banshee and not wait for Ubuntu to come out with the latest release. It gives the choice to me. Very, very powerful. So in this case, I was, I was talking with some folks earlier. It, the Linux gateway drug, <laughs> the Linux desktop gateway drug is Ubuntu. Um, I feel free that if, uh, you know, and I, I know this is going to happen. Canonical will piss me off in the next 18 months. <laughs> they will. And I'll switch to something else. I may go back and try Debian again. I might go to Fedora. But I feel confident I can do this because I've used Ubuntu for 18 months and I'm comfortable now using open source software. Um, so I want to just throw that out there. If you're looking to get started, check out Ubuntu. Now, here's a, uh, the Ubuntu Software Center so you can download stuff. Again, here's a shot of, here's, here's my Steam account. This was taken on my Ubuntu system. I, I don't have many games, I don't have time, but I love Portal. And I've only played like 40 minutes of it, so I'm like, because I, I got tired of having to boot into OS X or into Windows to play it. Now I don't have to. I can play it directly on my desktop, which is just exciting for me. Okay, so I mentioned that Mail was my critical app. So there, you get a lot of choices for email. Uh, the GNOME client is called Evolution. 
Uh, the KDE client is called Kmail, uh, and there is a, um, a Mozilla project, which you're probably familiar with, called Thunderbird. I tried them all. Uh, when I was running Debian as my des uh, distro for GNOME 3, I used Evolution, but it would break. <laughs> so I'd, I'd dutifully go and Google the error, and it would say, oh, run it in debug mode. So I'd put it in debug mode, and then it would work. <laughs> and so it would work for a couple of days, and then it would break, and, and I'd find, and uh, granted, I was using Wheezy. Wheezy was testing. You know, Debian is usually rock solid, but testing was just a little too unstable for me. So when I switched to KDE, I used Kmail. I was quite happy with Kmail. The problem I ran into with KDE was they have a thing called contact. Everything starts with a K, with a few exceptions. But like contact with a K, they had these QR codes that were like 800 by 800 pixels. They were these huge QR codes, and you couldn't change the font of the actual address. And I'm old, and so I was having to squint, and I just, you know, to read an address. So I said, okay, screw that. I'm not going to use it. I settled on Thunderbird. I think Thunderbird's amazing. Again, you can use Thunderbird on OS X. So if you want to get used to it, download Thunderbird. And you're able to do unified inboxes and all that good stuff that you get with Mail App. Um, one thing that Thunderbird has support for is plugins, such as plugins for encrypted email. One of the things that frustrated the heck out of me is that Apple, you know, no, no uh, nefarious uh, intentions, but they don't make it easy for you to encrypt your email. Um, there's, a, there's an open uh, GPG project, that, or Mac GPG, there's a project that actually does that. Um, but they literally have to reverse engineer every mail app that comes out. So that they can say, uh, and so every time there's an upgrade, GPG breaks for a couple of days while the guys figure out what they changed. With this, I install Enigmail, and boom, I've got built-in PGP and decryption and everything like that. It's fantastic. Um, I like the calendaring system. This is Lightning. Um, you can do everything you can do with Outlook when you get a little, hey, do you want to accept this invitation? You can put it on the calendar and stuff like that. Very, very pleased with Thunderbird and Lightning. Um, now, I run an organization where we have all different types of people. We have all different types of distros. One of the things that I needed was some way to synchronize my calendars and contacts across Android phones, iPod phones, um, sorry, I've watched Modern Family, and one guy referred to an iPhone as an iPod phone, and I, I have to keep doing that because I think it's funny. Um, and uh, all these different desktops, uh, OS X, different types of Linux. Well, I found this project called Sogo. And Sogo allows you to run your own synchronization server. Um, I'm going to talk about switching to Android um, a little bit later, and one of the frustrating things I found was the only way I could get the contacts from my desktop to my Android phone was to use Google. And I like Google. Google's sponsoring the party tonight. We're, I'm going to drink free beer on Google. And uh, you want to get on my side, you know, I'll talk, I'll talk good stuff about Microsoft if they buy me free beer. Um, but I don't want to share my contacts with Google. And so we found this thing called Sogo. It's out of, it's out of I think it's out of Finland. I know it's in one of the Norwegian, uh, one Scandinavian countries. Um, it's rock solid. I'm able to, it's got a web interface. I'm able to, there's plugins for Lightning, there's plugins for iCal, and our, my entire company runs on it now. We can set meetings and share it. It's really, really worth checking out. Again, it's extra credit. You don't need it to switch, but it really, really helps me in the fact that I can, uh, you know, pull out my phone and know that it's current. Web browsers. This is a no brainer. I don't even, this is the slide. We got web browsers. <laughs> I mean, we, almost all of the popular web browsers like Chrome and Firefox probably started on Linux. Um, I don't know if they did or not, but... Um, so we've got Firefox, we've got Chrome. This is Chromium, which is the pure open source version. You can still download the Chrome or Google version. Conqueror is the KDE one. You've got Opera. We, we have an excess of wonderful browsers. Now, I use Firefox. I use Chrome when I'm using Google Apps, which I do use some Google Apps. Um, but the thing I like about Firefox now is they have their own synchronization server called Firefox Sync. It used to be called Weave. Anyone using Weave or Sync? Um, when you get these slides, just Google how do I set up Firefox Sync. Very, very easy. They have packages. You can just, uh, I think you just build it from Git. You just check it out and run it. This allows me to sync all of my uh, bookmarks and passwords and stuff like that on a server I control. If you're not up for that, Firefox will allow you to do it on one of their servers, and it's pretty secure. You can read about how they set up these keys that only you get, so they can't peek into your passwords. But if you want that extra level of, I own this, if you have a server you can put this on, works really, really well. 
um, office options. Um, we've got K Office is the office suite that comes with KDE. Again, we had Open Office, which was Star Office back in the day. Um, Open Office uh, was purchased or acquired by Sun, and when the evil empire took over Sun, um, a bunch of people got pissed and forked it and formed LibreOffice, which is their right. <laughs> Um, LibreOffice is the default office that comes with Ubuntu. Um, for what I use Office for, it is more than enough. Um, I can remember back in the Mac days, I had an 800K floppy. And on it, I had the operating system, LaserJet drivers, um, McWrite, McPaint, and McDraw, and I had like 150K left over for files. And McWrite did everything, with the exception of a spell checker, because I'm a horrible speller, with the exception of a spell checker, McWright did everything I needed it to do, and it was 76K. <laughs> I forget how big Microsoft Word is now, but I'm not an online publisher. I don't need to publish newspapers. I just need to publish my little letter. Um, LibreOffice is fine. As I said, I, I end up doing everything, uh, expense reports, everything through um, LibreOffice. Um, again, this is something you should try. You can save it as doc and PowerPoint formats. So it works really, really well, because people still insist on sending me docx files. And as long as I can open them under LibreOffice, I'm fine. Um, really, really strong there. Accounting, not so much. So um, we use QuickBooks. I use a version that's about five years old, because again, it does everything I need it to do. I didn't feel the need to upgrade. Um, there is a GNU Cache. Um, from what I've looked at it, it's a very, very serious uh, attempt at an accounting project. It uses true double entry accounting, which things like Quicken don't. QuickBooks does, but Quicken doesn't. Um, so right now, I actually have an old Mac that all it does is run QuickBooks, and I use VNC. So I can just VNC into it and use it. Um, I could try to get the version for Windows to work under Wine. Wine is not an emulator, but it allows you to run, um, run Windows um, applications under um, Linux. Is it perfect? No, but maybe it would be perfect enough, but I just settled down. Yes, sir? The, oh, yes, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here talking about privacy. I don't really want my stuff up there, you know. Oh, right, 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 sorry, sorry. But then I'd have to get the Windows version because OS X won't let you legally run it in a, in a, because they want to control everything. See, that's why it's worse than we bitch about Microsoft as a community, and no one bitches about Apple, mainly because we can all respect Apple as a technology company in the back. Ah, I didn't know, but I'm no longer on an Apple branded computer, so that would be messed up because I went and bought the debt. I went, I like, I vote with my wallet. I get really upset when people say, you should. It's like, I'm going to, you know, when I look for hardware, I go to people who support Linux and I give them money because I like doing that. And so when Dell came out with a new Ubuntu laptop, I bought it, not necessarily because I really liked the laptop, but because I wanted to encourage that behavior. Good cookie, have a cookie. Good Dell. Mm. Um, um, graphics editing. Um, some people, you know, dealing with graphics, they say, I've got to have Photoshop. And okay, you have options now, but guess what Adobe just announced? If you want Creative Suite, you can't download it anymore. You have to use it in the cloud. And we're going to charge you 20 bucks a month forever to use it in the cloud. So if you create, think about it, you're going to create something. That's for one product, that's not the suite? Oh, jeez. Well, what bothers me is, is, is you're creating something, which is good. You're creating drawings, you're creating something, and then you're locking that creation up in this proprietary software. That bothers me more than paying for software. I pay for software all the time. I buy little apps, and I give money to open source developers if they have a little, you know, donate via PayPal. I do that. I want, again, here, have a cookie. Just keep doing that, more of that. Um, but the big one is GIMP, so I'm going to talk about these. We've got GIMP, um, Inkscape is one, Krita is, of course, KDE's graphic package, because KDE does their own version of everything. Uh, and then there's also Blender. Is, there are people making Hollywood movies, quality, Hollywood quality movies now using Blender, which is a 3D um, creation tool. It's amazing. I've never been smart enough to use it, but it is kind of cool. I do love me some GIMP. Every image that I did here, I edited under GIMP. Um, it's a really, really good tool. 
Uh, I did buy the GIMP book, but it's funny, I got it and it was GIMP on Windows. Not that that really matters, but you know, it was, I was like, okay, what are those weird icons around the window frame? Um, but no, GIMP is for what I do, again, for my, my needs, it's more than perfect. And the thing I love about it is if I'm on anybody's computer running an open source distribution, I can install it and edit my files. I control my creations, not Adobe. Um, media management. This, I keep adding, adding pictures to this slide. It's amazing what's out there to manage your, your, your videos and your podcasts and things like that. Are they as easy to use with devices as iTunes? No. iTunes is beautiful. I mean, it's a, it's a pig, don't get me wrong, but the functionality of it is, is, is there's a lot there. Um, but there are a lot of cool things going out there now. Like one of them I found just recently, it's called Nightingale. I think it was a fork of something called Sparrow. Um, and they seriously tried to, to become an iTunes clone. They, that's their thing. We're going to be like iTunes. So it looks very much like iTunes. They have the same genre, artist, album thing. It looks like iTunes. Where Nightingale fails, at least for me, is in device support. I want to be able to plug in a device and click and drag playlists and files from one system to the other. And Nightingale isn't as good about that. Uh, again, I've only been using it for uh, a, a few hours, but uh, for playing stuff on your, um, on your computer, it's great. Um, I also came across this thing called Tomahawk. Has anyone heard of Tomahawk? Uh, that's for the youngins in the crowd. Uh, Tomahawk basically says the idea of listening and organizing music on your hard disk is stupid and you should be, it's all going to be on the cloud. It's going to have Amazon Cloud, Last FM, Pandora, Spotify, all of these things. So they have plugins where you can create, um, you know, SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, Last FM, GrooveShark. You plug into all your online media and it allows you to manage that, which I thought is kind of cool because I never really, I don't do that. I'm old. I don't have a lot of media out there. Um, but uh, I did want to throw that out there because I would not heard of it and uh, it's, it looks to be pretty good. Um, Amarok is probably one of the better players out there. It's one of the few KDE applications that doesn't start with a K. <laughs> I never really understood. It ends with a K, but it's a, it doesn't start with a K. Um, Amarok is really cool. It was a, a, you can install it and run it on other desktops. That first install is going to look really huge because it's got to download all, pretty much all of KDE, so the libraries are there. But you can run Amarok on other distributions. Um, uh, I used it for a little bit and I found it was a little too, there was too much information there. And again, for me, the problem with KDE is that it was too customizable. So I don't use Amarok. Um, Clementine was one I played with. It has pretty decent device support. Um, Rhythmbox is what ships with GNOME 3 um, and with uh, Ubuntu. But I like Banshee. Uh, now, Banshee um, is, uses Mono, which is like part of C-sharp, something, it, it, everyone hates it because it, Microsoft's involved. But I really, really like Banshee because I can take um, this, the uh, micro SD card out of my phone, plug it in, and I can manage all of my playlists and everything directly in Banshee. Again, there's a PPA for Banshee, so I can get the latest and greatest Banshee. It's pretty cool. Um, I, the biggest failing of all of these guys is I was used to plugging my iPhone up to the computer and being able to deal with it. Um, with Android phones, uh, they've switched to this thing called uh, MTP, Media Transfer Protocol. It used to be when you plugged your Android phone in, it, was, it would mount as a USB drive, um, which is a block device. And what that means is only one thing can connect to a block device at a time. So the moment you connected it to your computer, your phone ceased being a phone, assuming that there was only one mount point, one SD card. Um, so what I found was I could pop the SD card out of my, um, my phone, store all my music there, and add this thing called is audio player. So you create this dot is audio player file. And here's an example of mine. And what it would allow you to do is, when you plug it in, Banshee recognizes that card as a media device. And then I'm able to drag my playlist and everything over, and it works really, really well. Um, so I threw that out there, because again, that was probably a week of my life figuring out how to do that. Um, the thing I do like about um, the, all of these is you can integrate with Ubuntu. I mean, here I got Clementine, Rhythmbox, and Banshee all installed. So you can integrate these things into the desktop and play your music.
Sorry, I'm going a little faster because I'm going to. I'll talk. I'm so excited about this. I'll talk all day, and I'm trying to get through this. Uh, managing photographs. This is a big thing. A lot of people um, really like uh, managing the photographs. So this is your iPhoto options. Digicam. Again, the K is for KDE. It's KDE's photo management. Again, it doesn't start with a K either, but it has a K in the middle. Um, Shotwell is kind of the big one right now. Uh, the thing I like about Digicam over Shotwell um, is. Um, is that Digicam allows you to order, or, uh, organize things into actual folders on your hard drive, whereas Shotwell is more of a tagging. You know, the, 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 they live where they live, but you tag the different things. But here's Digicam, very beautiful, very easy to use. Uh, Shotwell, again, is a very, very pretty um, uh, application. You've got Darktable, is more of a Lightroom uh, knockoff. Again, 100% free and open source software. I'm not a photographer. I pretty much take pictures with my phone. Um, but if you're a photographer, um, uh, you're good to go. Um, Aftershot, I put this up here. A friend of mine who's really into photography uses it. It's a pay. It's a commercial app. Um, but um, Windows, Mac, and Linux. So if you run Ubuntu or Fedora, they actually have packages that you can install. And I blame Shuttleworth for this. There are people like Corel. Now, Corel's always been pretty Linux friendly to begin with. But you know, now these people have this market they can exploit by, sending, by, by writing to Ubuntu. If you want to migrate from iPhoto, iPhoto uses a proprietary database. And so what I found was there was no easy way. All the photos were in this big file. There weren't like individual photo files. So I found this script on uh, um, Google Code, which allows me, it's called Foshare, which will actually run out and grab all of your folders and put them into file system. So it was, it was needed for me instead of trying to export and drag out 6,000 photos or whatever it, I had. So something to throw out there. Video editing, editing. I don't know if KDN Live is here, but they have been at other, um, other conferences. A really, really cool video editing suite. There's also OpenShot. Uh, when I got my, um, uh, my little Ubuntu, um, Dell Ubuntu system, I did a little boot video and compared it to my Mac booting the same way. It's much, much faster on the, uh, on the Dell. And I did a little video, and in setting it up, I needed to clip like 15 seconds of the, the thing. At get install OpenShot. And I mean, it was intuitive enough that I was able to load it in, clip out that 30 seconds, save it, and save it in a format that was perfect for YouTube, and upload it to the YouTube account. Amazing stuff. I recently had to have a head CT. So I, I asked, being a geek, I said, can I have a copy of it? And they gave me a disk. So I shoved the disk into my Ubuntu system, and I double clicked on an image, and it goes, oh, you don't have any apps to do this. But here's some that run. And so I, and it's something called Ginkgo something I installed. And pretty soon, I'm looking at pictures of my head. I mean, just wonderful stuff. Um, lots of really good apps out there. Virtual machines, uh, the Zen folks are here. Uh, this is KVM. It's very, very easy to create virtual machines uh, under Linux. Uh, one thing I have not been able to do is VMware Fusion allowed me to have like a Windows partition and I could run it from um, OS X. So I could, it kind of showed up and I could run it. I have not been able to figure out how to do that with KVM. Um, I can boot into it, I just can't run it. Um, here's some little extra credit. I'll throw this up there because this took me a week. Um, if you want to set up bridging, it's very, very easy to do with VMware Fusion. The idea is I want to have a virtual machine that has an IP address of its own so that I can get to it from other systems. Um, you have to set up bridging to get that to happen, and this is where you do it. You edit your Etsy interfaces, your Etsy network interfaces file. OK, um, I got eight minutes. Um, so at one point in time, I said, screw this. I'm going to go back to OS X. And, I, and, and if I'm going to, if I'm going to um, you know, uh, drink the Kool-Aid, I was all in. So I upgraded from Snow Leopard to Lion. I hated Lion. I frick and this is one of the reasons. Look at the iCal. Ooh, it has faux leather. It has this vomit brown border that's supposed to look like leather. And you can't see it here. If you actually, if you guys are running Lion, find one of the glowing fruit people and have them show you this. There's like a little piece of torn paper. Like right up over the today, there's this little piece of torn paper like someone tore off the thing. I don't want uh, you know, digital representations of real world things. I want efficient things. And Apple used to pride itself on being really clean and you could get the information. Now you've got, ooh, it's a book and there's a little bookmark and so I hated Lion. 
and the fact that it saved versions for you and you couldn't turn it off. And you'd, I'd cl- sometimes I'd get everything cluttered and I'd say, screw it, I'll log out and log back in. And I'd log back in and all oh, my stuff was still there. So I had to manually close it. Oh God, I hated lying. But I had time machines, so I put it back to Snow Leopard, and I have not looked, uh, looked back since. So everyone has this idea because you get locked in this idea that, well, Apple's just better, right? Because at one point in time, they were. But the, the truth of the matter is there's lots of good stuff out there, and Apple doesn't always make the right decisions. I bet you in the next version of OS X, this crap will be gone um, because so many people have complained about it. But I can't change it because I don't get the option. Um, I did like reverse scrolling. Anyone use reverse scrolling under uh, OS X? It's kind of cool because it's more natural for trackpads. Well, you can turn that on in, if you create a file called xmodemap in your, um, in your home directory, add these pointers, you can actually reverse scrolling, and it works really, really well. So again, I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I wonder if it's in Linux. A, a two-second Google search, and I had it. So I put that out there. I did switch to a mobile phone. Again, I tried to switch to, um, I had to try to get away from um, everything Apple. I think we should call them handies. I'm sorry, if you go to Germany, they call mobile phone handies. You'll see ads, you know, best price for your handy. And I think they mean handy is inconvenient, but they're not phones anymore. They're hand terminals. That's what they are. But hand terminals kind of, kind of hard to say. You know, give me your hand terminal. Show me what's your hand terminal. Handy's kind of cute. So I will, I'm going to try to single-handedly start calling them handies in America. And so if you look at me funny, that's where it was. So I got an Android phone. I bought a Galaxy S3 from AT&T. And within 45 minutes of getting home, I based it and put on CyanogenMod. <laughs> CyanogenMod is one of a number of Android open source projects they take. Because nowadays, when you buy a Samsung phone, there's crap on it. And I hate crap on my phone. Like, I, I saw a Yellow Pages app, and I said, oh, I want to remove the Yellow Pages app. You can't. The Yellow Pages app is a critical system app. It's critical because Yellow Pages paid you to put it on there, but it's not critical to me, and I want to make that choice. Love CyanogenMod. Uh, those guys are great. Um, the, they're getting ready for a 1.10 release, which I think is just going to rule. I'm running the release candidates right now. Um, things I like about it, again, everyone thinks Apple is the greatest when it comes to design. I actually have a, an unlocked 3GS I use when I'm overseas, and I feel constrained when I'm on an Apple phone. I just do. Um, one of the things I like is widgets. So you can put these things called widgets that just live on your desktop. They're apps that you don't have to open. Like, here's my calendar. You know, I can just glance at my calendar. This is on one of my desktops. Um, I, almost every app that I use, with the exception of Plants vs. Zombies, well, Plants vs. Zombies 2 will not be out on uh, Android, but um, you know, almost every app I use comes out of Android. Um, I like the fact you can customize the, um, the lock screen. So when I'm running Power Amp, I can actually be playing my music, and I don't have to unlock it to skip a track or replay a track or anything like that. It's really, really cool. Um, I do want to point out one of the things, one of the frustrations I had. My main frustration was to sync my contacts, I had to go through Google, which I've solved with Sogo. My other frustration is there really isn't a lot of open source software available for Android. Android's open source, but I use K- K9 Mail. Jesse Vincent, the guy who wrote Request Tracker, wrote K9 Mail, and it's really good, and it's FOSS. But outside of that, I'm looking forward to the day when we have more open source software on Android. But I really, really, I can't go back. And finally, there's this new uh, open source app called Redphone, which if I, make an Andro- if I make a phone call to another person on an Android phone running Redphone, it'll encrypt the voice. Now, there's a guy here from Verizon, but he says he doesn't involved in the I stole your stuff for the government. <laughs> Um, and I feel, I feel bad for him because I know someone's going to get that all weekend. Hey, did you steal my stuff? Um, but you can't encrypt voice on an iPhone because Apple doesn't allow developers access to that part of the phone. Android, they do, so you are able to get cool stuff like that. Okay, wireless routers, I'm going really quick here. Um, pardon? The multi-touch? Ubuntu Touch? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't played with it yet. Well, the way it works is actually based on CyanogenMod, and that's how they're going to port all the phones. So they're actually going to be shipping Ubuntu Touch on phones sometime this fall, like from manufacturers running CyanogenMod. 
I've been wanting to try that. So um, I don't have a Nexus phone, which is where a lot of the ports are now. But I think, I, see, I don't know. I, I think they say the Linux desktop is dead. Linux desktop might win by default. <laughs> because Apple wants to do, do stuff. I only have, I want to talk to you later. I got like two minutes to get through three slides. So I want to, I'll, I'll bug, but I do want to talk to you after. Um, anyway, I put this up. This is for Kevin Audi and the IPv6 folks over here. I bought an Asus router to replace my um, Airport Extreme. Put this um, Linux-based distro called Tomato, Tomato USB by this guy named Shibby out of uh, uh, Poland. And it has built-in IPv6 support. So you can do HE tunnels. You can do tons of really cool stuff. Um, so now I'm running open source. So I've gotten rid of my phone. I've gotten rid of my iMacs. I've now gotten rid of my router. What I haven't done is I still have my ITV DVR. I'm looking at XBMC and uh, open a LEC to replace that. I think there are drivers for the ITV um, USB, so that might be cool. And I haven't found anything for AirTunes. I love the fact that I can distribute music. I mean, there's some things that are coming up. If you guys know anything, find me and tell me. I think there's this thing called Sonos that has some kind of distributed player, but I haven't been able to get that to work. Anyway. What I want to leave you with is a lot of what's happening in IT is they're aimed at consumption. You know, Apple wants to make money because every piece of software you consume, they get 30% of it. But what I want you to do is choose to create more than you consume and choose to own your creations. Don't get locked up in Photoshop. Don't get locked up in, in, in Keynote. Don't get locked up in these proprietary formats. Choose, make the choice to own what you create. Uh, and then finally, uh, my, my experience, uh, it was frustrating. I said, but I love it. I can't go back now. Um, I'm in, in a great position. Opt out of the cloud. You know, make a decision when you post stuff on G Plus and Facebook and Twitter and you post your documents up there. Choose to do that. Don't just do it automatically because you have that right. Um, having options is the best feature. Everyone talks about, well, this is a great feature. To me, the, having the option to change something is the best feature any application can have and own what you create. Anyway, it is right at 10 o'clock. This is me. Um, I do have a blog called adventuresinoss.com with a no Apple tag, which has details of all the different things. Thank you so much. We have a party tonight. MC Frontalot is here. The Thought Criminals are here. Google's paying for the beer. Hope to see you tonight. Thank you very much. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer bootcamp. 
Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, 
we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.